On today's podcast, we have Casey Ba. I've been so excited for this episode because I've been able to watch Casey's whole career. When I got home from my mission, Casey had moved into my neighborhood and was just starting out his door-to-door career, which ended up being 15 to 16 years. He's part of Vivint, which went from 30 million in revenue to over a billion dollars. He uh, was a big part of investing in that and bought some more stock, which uh, led to a great outcome. Blackstone came in, they went through their IPO process, and he had an incredible story throughout that. Post door-to-door, he jumped in and started Sandlot Partners, which is an investment firm They've just now hit over $600 million in capital that they've deployed uh, through their group. So we're going to go through two different phases of his career today. The first phase, which is door to door, and then jump into a second phase, which is growing money in the investment world. I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Casey, it's been so cool to watch you from my perspective, right? Because I I got to meet you when you were kind of just getting started. And then to catch up the other week or month in Lake Powell this summer. Yep. And just to watch that, like, from A to Z. No, I, I'd say this exact same thing about yourself. I yeah. Mean, when, when I first met you, you were a little baby. You just came, <laughs> you know, you got Andrea that went yeah. out and sold, and she met Paul. and Yeah. You know, and then you you went out, and, you know, your your wife's Alicia, right? That's my sister, Alicia. Alicia. Alicia's yeah. your sister, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and I just remember, like, just being, like, this kid's got so much talent, yeah. but you, it was harnessing it, you know, it was figuring it out. And yeah. I don't think you would ever dream that you'd still be in this industry 15 years later, 20 years later. You know what I mean? Definitely not. It's just, it's weird. Yeah. Like you said, how life happens for you. You know, my personality was I'm more interest, introverted. That's where I recharge my batteries is being alone and planning and organizing and creating and yep. all that. Right. And so door to door selling was like the opposite of anything I ever thought I would do, Yep. but things happen and I'm super grateful for it. I, I've seen so many introverts do well in do this well, job though. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. It, you know, you, you can kind of balance both. You can take that time to recharge and recommit and recalibrate and, you know, but then you go exert that energy on a specific task. Yeah. And it's that end of itself is recharging. Like when you go out and you execute, like you, you tremendous amount of fulfillment, you know what I mean? Where, For sure. But like being able to, I, I would probably say I'm very similar. Like, you know, I do a ton of social stuff, Yeah, but I get my energy when I can be alone yeah, and when I can recalibrate, like you said, ponder and meditate and yeah, you know, yeah. My mornings, I mean, and I learned this from Covey when I got to know him just a little bit right before he passed away, but he wouldn't schedule any meeting until after lunch. He's like the morning's mine. When he would go out and speak everything, it was always after lunch. It was like non-negotiable. And so I just, I caught on to that. And so my mornings, is when I can get up and meditate and work out and create. And I think I've heard you say this before that I think that's when your energy, I don't know if it's the greatest or worst, but for me, it's the purest. Yeah. Cause then throughout the day, you know, you get worn down and things happen, stress, anxiety, goals, wins, whatever you just mix in all that. But I just feel like the morning for me is that's that sacred time yep. when everything's pure. Yeah. It, it, it feels like most of the people that I know that are successful have those rituals or those habits. You know, yeah. the, there's a handful of exceptions, but for the most part, the people that I know that are successful, they're, they're really good in those hours when nobody's watching them. Yeah. And they, they take advantage of those hours and they kind of create the day before the day gets started. For sure. Well, let's, let's jump into the door to door stuff. Cause I, when I look at you, I'm like, man, there's kind of like the two phases to the Casey boss story and I'm, that's oversimplified. Right. But your door to door career, and then I'll call it. The investment world, which is to me is growing money. Growing money is a unique skill set. Yep. And so started Atlas, you got in. I still remember your story, you know, here 20 years later of you basically investing everything you had into books Yo. when you first started. Yep. And to me, education's everything. It doesn't have to be formal education, which we'll talk about later with Harvard and stuff, but non formal education's changed my life. Like we were just talking about Covey, yep. you know, that that's exactly it. So, um, what made you want to start investing in education like books? Um, I, I just got kind of convinced of it early, um, that like, that was the way, you know, the Jim Rohns that kind of 
you know, would say, hey, you, you need to invest more in yourself than you are in your job. Yeah. And that your, you know, your earning, your, your learning always needs to outstrip your earnings. You know, that you're never going to make more than your, your personal level of competency. And so for some reason early on that clicked and I like physically put it into practice where I said, hey, I'm, I'm going to make this, you know, and I still do it today. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I've been back to Harvard 18 weeks over the last decade, lived on campus and done focus courses, whether it's, you know, strategy or negotiation or behavioral economics or finance or marketing. How many um, different courses is that? It's, it's like, like four. 16 different courses you know, electives and a long course. And I'm going back. I, I just started a new one. So I, I just started one that I head out to on Friday. It's a three-year course. It's $150,000 over three years. It's called Owners, Presidents, Managers. And it's for business owners that have a business with over $10 million of revenue. So it's all entrepreneurs. And the the for me, it's like that cost is not a cost. It's uh, an investment yeah. that I expect uh, you know, my greatest returns on those dollars, but that takes faith. You know, it takes, you know, planting the seed with the expectation that you're going to get a harvest. And a lot of people have a tough time with that. They have a tough time spending real money investing in themselves. You know, they, they see it as a waste of money and they'd rather put it. And I, and I just, I, I see it different in my personal life. I've seen the, you know, I, I I've seen it pay off. Yeah. You know, I remember reading every sales book that I could get my hands on. I saw my earnings double and triple and quadruple just because I came a better salesperson, a better then leader, a better a, manager. Yep. An easier decision for you. Yeah. Right? So, so for me, it's kind of been this like virtuous cycle of invest, see a better return, invest, see a better return. And so I want it to be a part of my life forever. That's cool. And so whether it's Harvard or Tony Robbins or the Disney Institute or whatever, I, you know, I, I feel it's important to have stuff that you become fully immersed. So you have to leave your house, have nothing else to do for a week, two weeks. You're all and in. And to be all in in that yeah. experience, is, it's just, it, in my experience, that's the only way that I learn. Mm -hmm. I can't do it kind of halfway. Um, Who is I'm, it? Who was the first one at Vivint to do that? Because you guys kind of, there was um, a culture there of no, that I, learning. No, I, I, um, I don't know. Because uh, I, 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 was, I, was, right? I was the first one to go to Harvard. Oh, you were sure. the first one to yep. do Harvard. Yep. Uh, did I, you know anybody that had done that? I never did. Um, I I don't know what you just, came of it. Yeah, That's crazy. Yeah. Did you end up graduating? Yep. So I graduated. So but like I, back in the day or did you do no, that? I, I, I never did. Uh, I dropped out of school. Yeah, that's so what I was wondering. I don't have a degree. Yeah. Don't ever plan on getting a degree. Yeah. Because it wasn't about the degree. It's purely about education no, is what it, we're yeah. talking about. And, right? and it's not that, like, I, I teach up at BYU. Yeah. I'm, I'm never telling people, hey, don't get a degree. I'm telling them the opposite. Hey, like, stay in and go finish it. Like, yeah. I, you know, I don't regret my journey. But I should have, you know, I should have finished. I, I was a year off, you know, and I just don't like not finishing anything. Yeah, just like, that yeah like yeah. I, I like closing the loop. And it actually took me a long time to actually get comfortable with it. And it was probably five or six years ago where I'm like, you know what? I'm never finishing and I'm completely good with it. And that's my journey. And yeah. it's not going to me spending time there or me spending time at Harvard. I get way more out of Harvard. So I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to yeah. spend my time on something that's going to give me a lesser return. Sure. And something that's, I'm just not, life's too short. It's and, investment yeah. paradigm. Where and are you going to get the greatest return it was on your one time? Of the, it was actually like this, like at peace moment where I had like these personal insecurities that I just kind of came to, came to terms that, oh, this is my journey. This is who I am. This is going to be a part of my story. And I just need to own it. You know, I need to have a badge of honor and just own it. That's that this is my cool. story. And since then, you know, like haven't thought twice about it since, you know, yeah. haven't. He talked about that principle of just not finishing. When I look back at my door to door career and like what went well and, and what mistakes I made, you know, I did one year of Vivint. It was apex. then. that was my first year ever selling. And then I did one year satellite and then I did four years of pest control. And then I jumped in and started my software company and then, you know, came back into the industry and started this, but but if I could go back, which you can't, so it's just you reflect and say, you know, what can I pass on? What knowledge? I just would have stayed at Vivint. Yeah. 
right? And and I see this in the industry, like looking back at at this time now, fast forward 15, 20 years, every year there was new companies coming up, small ones, everybody's offering a better deal, whatever. And there's like these two buckets of people that I saw and witnessed. And then you get to fast forward and watch how this, this movie plays out. And the first bucket is the people that are, let's call them the deal shoppers. They're always trying to get the best deal. Yep. And back in the days when we were at Vivint, there's a lot of, of alarm companies that would pay you more per deal. Yep. But then you looked at the guys that just stayed put, the Casey Baws, the Jeff Mendez, the Bodie Gardners, the Scott Browns, whoever. And then you, you let these two different buckets, you give them 15, 20 years. And to me, the trajectories are not even close. I don't it's even a, know where these deal it, shoppers it's, are. It's a significantly different outcome. And I, I, you know, so the caveat to that is you got to choose a great partner. For sure. You know, like, but don't you think most of the talent was at Vivint back in the day? Um, yeah. I, I, I think there was a lot of talent that left Vivint that left the industry. Yeah. And they end up leaving the industry because they get sold a story. Yeah. That, hey, this is the next big thing. And when it's not the next big thing, you just, you're not going to go a third time or you're not going to go a fourth time and you just yeah. transition out. Sure. And so I saw, I saw a lot of some of the best guys they ever worked with left Vivint, then left the industry and, and have never kind of found it. They've always, mm. you know, been going from thing to thing to thing. So I, you know, I, I wish I could say I was smarter than I was like so much of mine was luck. And I like, I really believe that like Atlas going bankrupt was so lucky for me. And you look at it and you're like, well, that doesn't seem very lucky. You lost all your money. But you never but would have ended what, up. What it did it, right? was it burned my boats for me. Hmm. I didn't have to wow. like choose to like, Hey, I'm going to burn my boats. I'm all in my, my boats were burned. And so when I started that Vivint experience, I was five years by necessity just to get back on track. And, and it was this blessing where I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to decide. And, and I treated the, the industry with a different level of professionalism or respect that I, I just don't think I would have given it. I was too good for the job. Hmm. As a 22 year old kid, I was too good for the job in my head, which doesn't make any sense to me. I, I from a small town in Logan, didn't have any skills, you know, but still I thought, oh, I'm better than door to door sales. And it took, you know, a financial collapse and a company going bankrupt and me losing everything to get humble enough to realize there's 14% unemployment right now. Wow. And somehow I have this skill set that's worth a half a million bucks a year. And I've got 10 companies that want me to come work when no one is hiring. Yeah. And I'm like, there's something. And Todd Peterson was a big, men, still is big mentor and hero of mine. Um, but there was something about me meeting with him and him being so proud of the industry that he was in and so proud of his career and his job that I'm like, if he's proud, I can be proud of it, you know, and, and it, it changed in me. Hmm. And from there on out, I was super proud of what I did, you know, and I, I yeah. just, I, I owned it and, and I was there, I think 16, 17 years. I mean, it, it ended up being kind of this special run and this special career. And, you know, you talk about, um, MPWR is like financial freedom and self-development and that, that's what Vivint was for me. It was make money and invest it every yeah. year. Yeah. And then go grow as a person, you know, yeah. use that as a platform to go, you know, so, so much of my personal growth comes when I teach, you know, I retain so much more when I have to package and articulate something. And it just gave me a platform to do that kind of endlessly. You know, you'd go out for a summer and you, you, you train hundreds of times and you, you, yeah. you, then it's part of you. Yeah. You, you, you perfect your craft and you perfect your, your skill and you become yeah. a professional. You, you, you work to get to those 10,000 hours sure. of mastery, you know? Yeah. What is it that you, that you learned about recruiting? Because from the outside watching you and I'm not, I won't name other names, but just other leaders that were at the same company for a long time that still had a lot of success. But if I look at Casey and say, man, what's the, what's different in Casey's, I just believe you've always had this thing of people want to be part of what you're doing. That's probably a huge reason why Sandlot's been so successful too, is why you can just send out a text and say, we got this deal going on and it's probably just boom, you know? And so I think a lot of that is who you are. 
and how you've lived your life, but what did you learn about recruiting that made you successful? So I, so I think it goes to a couple of things. I think there's like a, a, a couple, you know, leadership principles on there. John Maxwell is kind of like one of my all time favorite leadership teachers for kind of the same reasons that Cubby was a favorite teacher. He, he's so good at making complex things simple for sure and to organize them in a way that you can remember them. And, yeah. and one of the, he's, he's got a book called the 21 laws of leadership. And one of the laws, it's called the law of the lid. And the law of the lid basically states that if you're a seven on a scale of one to 10, you're not going to attract eights and nines. Like you're only going to attract sixes and below. And so for you to attract seven, eights and nines, you need to become a seven or an eight or nine, which tackles personal development and, 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 it, and, it, and it's not just one aspect. Yeah. You, could, you could be a nine in one area and a four in the other. Yeah. And so it's saying, you know, and so you could be highly attractive to people in certain areas and other areas you have no influence. And so the whole idea of influence, you know, t- you take another step. Trust is a very interesting thing. You know, Stephen Covey's son, he wrote this book called The Speed of Trust. But he says that trust has two pieces. You've got character and you've got competency. And um, we, we, we think about trust so generally. We say, you know, I trust my dad or I trust my best friend. Yeah. And we think that that's like all encompassing. But Which if, is usually the character side. But, but if you really drill down, it's, it's significantly different. So like, um, you know, the question is, do you trust your dad? Yes. Do you trust your dad to do brain surgery? No. no. And so what you found was I, my dad is a good person. But competency, he's competent in some areas, or my mom's competent in some areas. And so when I, when I go back to, you know, why I had influence and had success at Biven, um, Todd, you know, he, one of the greatest blessings that a leader has ever done for me was Todd telling me that I couldn't be a regional manager. And it was so hard for me. I'd been a regional manager at Atlas. And I was coming over, and I just felt kind of entitled to at least the same position. This felt, was that first year? That first year, I felt okay. like I'd earned it. Yeah. And, and he basically said, and it, he was sincere, where he just said, you're never going to have influence with people if you haven't done the work that you're telling them to go do. And he said, you have to go manage, you have to go sell, and you have to go do that work to ever have influence. And it was this hard medicine. And I had competitors tell me the opposite, saying, you we'll can be do regional you day want. one, yeah. you can have your own office, here's a yeah. salary, here's this. And that sounded better, but I knew that what Todd was saying was true. Um, and I ended up going there, and I didn't cut any corners. If I remember, you went out and like went and sold for a couple of weeks, right? It, it was Like you told your wife, like, It was, like, a, it was a lot more this. than that, yeah. I, yeah. I put this schedule together where I said, I'm going to Arizona, and I'm not coming home till I have 10 accounts. So it was open ended and, and I ended up took. going and selling, you know, 10 in a week and then drove home, recruited, then went back out the first of January, first of February. And I ended up having 68 preseason. Wow. And by the time the summer started, I knew how to sell in the cold. I knew how to sell before five. I had like this confidence and I went out and I think that year I made like $560,000 my first year at Vivid. First year this switching. Is, a long time ago. Wow. And, but what I did was I'd managed a 3,000 account team. I'd sold over 300 accounts with my personal. So I'd been a top 10 rep. And for the rest of my career, I was able to ride on that track record of this is what you need to do to be successful in preseason. This is what you need to do to be successful in the summer. Yeah. This is what you need to do to run a successful office. And I never would have had that foundation if I wouldn't have had a leader that told me, what was true instead of what I wanted to hear. And that, and it's so hard because, and, and you're in this spot where you, you've got people that are pushing you to tell them what they want to hear and telling the truth is harder because there's a lot of times there's fear of loss. Yeah. And I think that's why I, you know, Todd has always had so much influence with me is because he always told the truth. He, he, he always told me the way it was and not the way that I wanted to hear it. And so I trusted him, you know, I, I trusted that he was one, a good person, and then two, that he had the competency and the skill set. And, you know, so you fast forward and, you know, whether success in other ventures comes down to do people think that you're a good person? Yeah. 
And do people think that you are competent? Do you actually have the skill set for the thing that you're going to do? And I think about that a lot. And with that whole idea of the law of the lid saying, if I'm an eight, I'm never going to track nines and tens. And so I need to go work on my craft to become better. I've got to get better. And that's kind of where that whole lifelong Kaizen continuous learning, you know, philosophy comes in. That's where there's so much beauty in this space that if you're not in door to door, it, for me, I feel like it's a refiner's fire. I don't think I would have ever learned the law of the lid to the same degree you learn it in this Yo, space, it, right? It's, it's raw. It's it, so it, raw. It's so raw and it's so real. And it becomes more pronounced every year that goes by. Yeah. Just because my, my experience is younger generations don't know how to work the same way older generations work. Like manual labor was just a part of the ethos. Growing like it was up. just a, yeah. what you did. Yeah. And and 10 to 20 years older than me, it was like even more so. For sure. And so the idea of people going into a role that's so intense and a lot of like labor, physical labor and mental and emotional stress and that refiner's fight, you just become, if yeah. you can make it out of it, you become like battle tested. Well, it's just so different than a traditional industry, right? If I work at a company, let's say Adobe, I can hire who I want and based off my tenor, what my experience, my degree, I'm behind the your resume yeah. a lot. But in this industry, I was just talking with somebody upstairs. He just left a company and I was telling him, you know, people don't leave companies, they leave, leave leaders. And at the end of the day, I'm like, we're not in the solar business, we're in the people business. Yo. I genuinely feel that way, Yo. right? It's an industry where you can go work anywhere you want to work. There's no salary. There's there's no hiring for certain leaders. You you build your org. Yep. And so with that, the law of the lid is so important, more so than any other industry I've seen. And that's what forces you to, to learn it. So I, it's a beautiful thing. Um, kind of transitioning into maybe the second phase of your career, growing money. When you were doing door-to-door, you're making good money. At what point... Did you learn, I got to be investing in this and being smart with my money? Because I know that's a big part of your identity there. It's been there. from the first day that I made any money, I was investing it. And it, same thing, I got, somehow I bought into this idea of investing and sacrificing today for more later. Yeah. And I just, I bought into it wholeheartedly. It's the same reason that you would read a book. It's the same reason that you would do a workout is you're sacrificing today yeah. For more. For a later reward. Yeah, more time, more yeah. health, more knowledge, you know, but it you can do the easy thing today and have it be hard tomorrow. And, I, and that same thing applied with investing. And, you know, Alex Dunn, he, uh, same thing, he was president at Vivint for a long time, you know, top five mentor of mine, person I really look up to, is almost like a second dad to me. And he says something about entrepreneurship that I think would apply with investing as well, which is the way to learn about entrepreneurship is to become an entrepreneur. Like the real way to learn how to start a business is start a business. You're not going to learn it in textbook. You you learn it in like the, how do I get this entity set up? And you're like working through this problem and then you solve this problem and now you know how to solve the problem or how do I get my payroll set up or my CRM or all this? Like you actually learn it when you're doing it and it matters. And there's consequence if you don't do it right, where it's the same thing with investing. The way to become a great investor is to invest. And you know, it's, it's scary for people because they, you know, they don't want to, you take that whole parable of the talents and you've got, you know, the, the master of the house, he, he leaves his, you know, servants, with money or with talents and one has one and one has two and one has five and the person with five goes and develops his talents. He goes and puts them to work. He invests, yeah. he or she invests and he comes back and he has double the talents and the master's happy. And then the second one has less talents, but they put them to work and they double them and he's happy. And the third, they had the least amount of talents and they didn't want to make the master mad. So they hit him. And they gave him back the one talent. And the master got frustrated and took the talent and gave it to the one who had the most. And I always like, I remember learning about this when I was young. And I was like, that doesn't seem very, you know, just, you know. But what he was basically saying, think about this from a leadership standpoint. Who do you give like all of the hard jobs to? 
Yeah. It's the person who has everything on their plate anyway because they just do so much. You're like, I just need somebody that can get the job done. And you'll have one or two or three people that you can just rely on. And you just say, like, that person's not doing anything. I, like... (laughs) I talked to that person a week ago. Nothing has happened. Take the responsibility. Give it to the person that already has way more on their plate than they need. Yeah. Just because you know they're a doer and they're going to go get it done. I think that's the that's the principle. And so for me, it was always just central. It was always, I'm going to invest every dollar that I have every year, and I'm going to go be broke the next year. And and I think I think I worked with, you know, significantly more hunger. Because of it, I, you know, my experience is that people get complacent when they have too much cash in their checking account. And if you yeah. just put it to work and forget about it, you fast forward down the year and then, it, then it's that principle of compounding. It's just like, if you compound, you will be wealthy. Yeah. I think that was awesome. One, one of the things that you said in Link Pal that I think took a lot of guys by surprise was you said, look, I don't keep a lot of money in my bank account. I'm investing all the time. And I think there's an idea of when you're younger or maybe newer on the money game journey, if you know somebody that's wealthy or rich, like let's say you know somebody that's worth 5 million bucks, somehow in your mind, I think people think he has 5 million sitting in his bank account. Yo. And if somebody's worth 5 million, usually they might not have anything in their bank Yo. account because it's probably all working for him. Yep. And it's just not how people think. But as you learn about money, you start to understand that. So... This is really big, though, what we're talking about, because you're doing door to door, but you're starting to invest. Yep. Now, your core competency back then, not now, was door to door, not investing yet. Yep. So we were talking yesterday and in the industry, you know, it's a, it's a proud thing to say, I have 50 doors, I have 100 doors, I have 200 doors, whatever, because there's like this 100 door benchmark. And what was fascinating yesterday is you're like, Brandon, I don't have any doors. Like I've always just been investing in funds and projects and things like that. So, so why let's talk about that. I mean, we already spoke about it yesterday, but for the podcast, why did you decide to go that route? So the, one of the best investment books ever written is a book called the richest man in Babylon. And it's this totally you know, agree with this, by this the way, story of this guy that our cad. Yeah. Our cad that, you know, he, he's, Bum because his buddy, you know, is the wealthiest guy in Babylon and he's just slaving and he has nothing it, like he can't get ahead. Yeah. And he's like, I'm working just as hard as that guy. And that guy has everything and I've got nothing. And so he goes and actually like humbles himself and, you know, gets taught Yeah, by his friend. And, and there's some really simple lessons. Um, but one of the lessons is he says, you got to pay yourself first. And that's that principle of just investing it, just putting it to work you figure out how to make life work after you've invested the money. But if you don't invest it, it's going to get chewed up. It, it just like, you, you know, saw this firsthand being in this industry I've for seen 15 thousands years. thousands of people that Lose made it, right? so much money yeah. that really have nothing to show for it. And it, it vanishes. It disappears. I, I, I can't explain it. But then the other piece is after you get it, you have to go put it to work. You can't, put it under your mattress. Like if you left your money in cash last year, you lost 10% with inflation at least, you know? And so you, you, you got to go put it to work. You got to own assets to get wealthy. And so, you know, he goes out and he gives money to the, to the Phoenician or he gives money to his, the brick maker to go buy diamonds. Yeah. And he loses all of his money. And the richest man in Babylon was like, he knew that he had lost it before, um, the guy in the story he lost it. Yeah. yeah. And he basically said, yep, the Phoenicians are scoundrels. They, they took advantage of you. And he came back and they sold him glass instead of diamonds and he lost all his money. But the core principle that he learned from that is invest in the brick maker to build bricks. Yeah. And invest in the shield maker to make shields. And that one simple principle has made me millions and millions and tens of millions of dollars. And that's just, we, we follow that principle. So I won't invest anybody, with anybody that's not the expert in their field. And so yeah. even within real estate, I've got seven or eight different real estate partners because it's so specialized. The person who's best in the world in, in multifamily isn't going to be the best in the world in storage or affordable housing or hotels, industrial, industrial, you know, land development. Yeah. It's a, it's a different expert. And so it's, I've got 
somebody that I invest with on multifamily, somebody that I invest with in industrial, a different person I invest with in storage, different person that I invest with on manufactured housing, different person, you know, in hotels. And so like, and that was the thesis of Sandlot, right? Is go find the experts. That, in that, these that's, different that's literally fields. all we, we, we've, yeah. deployed, we've deployed, you know, it'll be kind of over 600 million at the end of this year. And it's that one simple principle of find the expert, invest in the expert. So everybody's like, Oh, you know, you can have all sorts of different investment theses, and ours is we're not going to be the smartest guys in the room, hardly ever. Yeah. And if you are, you're in the wrong room. But what makes me smart is I can partner with the best people. That makes me smart. And so going and partnering, and so if you look at any deal that we've done, it's finding somebody that's world-class in that particular field. Yeah. And then finding really world-class operators, whether it's the CEO of a company, whether it's David Nealman with Breeze Airways, whether it's Bart Longston with ClickLease, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, Bruno Lima with Pura, whether it's Lance Bolin with Colmena and Industrial Warehouse, whether it's Jeff Brownlow and, you know, Rob Anderson with Arch Energy and Oil and Gas. It's like it's different people for different assets. And it's because they, you know, it's the same as if somebody were to go and say, I'm going to invest in Brandon because he spent his whole life in the door to door. And so I just know he's going to succeed. I don't even know what he's going to do, but I just know he'll succeed because he's sure. successful. And yeah. so it's finding that person that has 10,000 hours in that category and partnering with them. And that's, so that is like, I don't want to oversimplify what we do, but that's what we do is hunt for that person all day, every day. Yeah. And when we find that person, go as deep as we can in that partnership. Partner up and be abundant, right? Yep. They're the best in their field and there's plenty of room for everybody. Um, where did you learn your weekly planning routine? Um, it's a combination of like all sorts of thought leaders and all sorts of like hundreds, yeah, together. hundreds of books. I, I yeah. definitely say the core is seven habits for sure. You know, have a, have a journal, write in your journal, outline your roles, you know, list off goals, you know, have a mission statement. All that stuff is kind of core to it. Uh, Tony Robbins, I've taken so much from Tony Robbins out of anybody who lights me up. He's the most. Um, he just like, I, you know, adore the guy. I think he's like a special, special human Same for the impact that he's made on the world. And he's, you know, and myself, you know, I'm one of millions of people that could say, man, that guy changed my life. Yeah. And so it's trying to like pull the very best, you know, Jim Rohn has some really good stuff. He, um, you know, Darren Hardy, the, the, there's a lot of different thoughts. So I don't know where it all came from. It's just kind of been a culmination of, you know, 20 years of trying new things and implementing them. But I yeah. kind of have a system at this point that works for me and is customized for me. And, you know, it's become, you know, my secret sauce as far as productivity. For sure. I know a lot of our reps are going to be interested in that because they see Hunter and Sarah Clark that work for us are always posting and you're always sharing their story every, every week they've done a weekly planning where they've tagged you, I think for like a year. Long time. Yeah. yeah. And so, and I like, it's no wonder that they're successful. Totally. You know, like if you, if you have a plan and you're executing that plan, you're going to succeed. Yeah. So the, like the two minute version is spending time every Sunday morning, creating what you want to create and looking at your, your goals, right? Yep. Looking at the different areas of life. What are the areas of life that you quickly? I mean, the, the, there's only like six or seven that matter. Like yeah. you, you could go into any room in any country in the world and they're going to vary a little bit, but not too much. And you've got your, your physical body, you've got your relationship with God, you've got your, you know, your personal development or your, your growth mentally, you've got your career, you've got your, you know, relationships, you've got your intimate relationship, your significant other. Sure. That's about it. You know, you've got your, your, your finances. Finance, yeah. Yeah, you've got your career. You've got your yeah. finances, which are two separate things. People lump them together. They're t two completely separate things. Your, your finances and your career. You, how, how many of us know professional athletes or doctors or attorneys or people that make a lot of money and don't have any money? Oh, sure. So you can be terrible with finances and be excellent in your career. Absolutely. And so it's, you know, trying to be... Door to door, yeah. to what we were just talking about. Actually have like a category yeah, and then ask the question on a, on a weekly basis, what's the most important thing 
that I can do in this role. And that, that's something Which is I, like the Pareto. So you, then you Pareto each yep. one of those and say, what's the top three things or do you only do one? Um, some of them I'll do 10 things, you yeah. know, Sandlot, okay. I've got 10 things where some of them it's two to three. Sure. I, I try to keep it as few as possible. You know, when everything's important, nothing's important. Sure. So I try to tighten it up. Some of them just require more. Some of them, it turns into a checklist, which is like, these things have to happen this week. And I just have to look at them every day and, and grind on them until that checklist is done. And that's probably going to be more natural for your work, your yep. full-time work at that time to be the bigger one and get more to do's. Right. But, but it's amazing. Like even just having it as a reference point last, last night, I was tired, like really tired. You know, we, we, we've got five kids and two of them are really young. And so it takes an hour to like actually the get the routine. kids down. Yeah. yeah. And so we got sure. them down and I'm ready for bed. I'm like, and I can hear my wife and my daughter kind of having like a, like a heated real conversation, my 14 year old. And I'm like, this isn't something you get efficient with. This isn't. And we end up talking till midnight and it was super good, but it was one of these lessons where I'm like, you're effective with things or you're efficient, you're, with, you're, things. You're, you're efficient with things. You're effective with people and effectiveness is however long it takes. hundred percent. And it was one of these lessons where That's I'm like, a covey. yeah. And, and on my list that week, it was, you know, connect with my daughter, make sure that she knows I love her. And I had a window to go listen to her for two hours, way longer than I wanted to. And it wasn't at the time you would have wanted and, and either, the right? exact time when, you know, I, what I wanted to do is shut it down and, you know, go to sleep. <laughs> Let's do this tomorrow. But it was like, no, I, she's more important than me getting a full night of sleep and I'm paying for it today. You know, I'm like, yeah, I, I got my whoop band and I'm like a 16% recovery. I'm like, oh man, I got crushed last night. And it was worth it. And I do it a hundred times because I put first things first. I actually prioritized the thing that mattered. Yeah. And I'd made that decision before the event took place. Mm -hmm. That was decided before that, that was decided up. in that Sunday planning session or in one of hundreds for a long, long time. That's the hard thing. Like that, that statement that you just said, that it's a coveyism, if you will. That I've learned in my career, it's hard as a, a leader, business owner, entrepreneur, whatever, because with things to be efficient, you can plan those. You can, you can schedule when you're going to do everything. Yep. And the, the part I found with people that's so hard is it usually doesn't come when you want to want it to happen. You get that unexpected phone call. Something's happening. You have a meeting, but it's like, dang, I got to be effective with people yep. as long as it takes. Right now, when I had all this other stuff, it's just, it is what it is. So if you're listening to this podcast, this one statement can change everything. And you probably, if you work for us, you probably have heard me say it a bunch, but efficient with things, effective with people. And when you, when anybody needs your time and it's that moment, like Casey's talking about with his daughter, all things on hold, man, it's whatever it takes, right? It's like you get a handful of those ever. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, they happen once a year. They happen once every two years and you better be ready when they show up. And it's the same thing, you know, with like, when you talk about recruiting, the reason the people who are successful, the recruiting, it's because they, you know, give people time. Yeah. They, it's as long as it takes and slow is fast and fast is slow. You know, when you're trying to like really get through it and you know, you, you end up not getting great results where, yeah. and, and, there's an art and a science to planning and the art, you know, uh, Peter Drucker, he's kind of the known as the father of modern management theory, um, written 30, 40 books. You know, he's passed away now, but he's got a book called the effective executive. And one of the biggest things is effective executives keep more than half of their schedule open. Hmm. And that's like really tough to that's do. If you're so into hard. efficiency, you've huh. got like every hour plan back to back to back to back. But what that does is it does not allow you to be spontaneous. For sure. And it does not allow you to prioritize people because you have over scheduled yourself. Yeah. And so even, you know, this, this podcast, I was on a call with an investor and the podcast starts at 10 and I'm 20 minutes over on this call. And I'm like, the call's more important because this investor is more important. And yeah. I just need to give him, he's a senior guy, loves to talk, excited <laughs> about a deal we're doing. 
Yeah. And I just let him keep talking until he was done talking. And he didn't know that it was putting me out. Sure. And we, you know, and he's given us a million bucks. And that's and, just how it goes, and right? That, you know, but we didn't even talk about the money until the end of the call. And it was almost a formality. Hmm. Um, and so you, anyway, it's just effectiveness comes with however long it takes. And that, yeah. that's where the art comes in, in, in scheduling. And that dance. Yeah. Right? Like if, if you can understand that, you know, that Pareto principle, there's kind of like the Pareto principle on steroids, which is the top 20, the top 20 or the top 4% of your activities give you 96% of your results. Mm -hmm. But really, if you understand that, you know, 20% gives you 80% of the results, you yeah. can be very inefficient in your schedule. You can have a tremendous amount of waste and be extremely effective. For sure. If you're just making sure that you get those big rocks or you get those priorities in your schedule. And yeah. so that's kind of, you know, if I really boil down to the, the essence of planning on a weekly basis is getting clear on what those things are and scheduling them and just making sure that they happen. Cause I, I don't really have to think about my schedule for the rest of the week. Yeah. I, I just know, Hey, the stuff that I've identified the that matters 20%. is on my schedule and yeah. now it's just automatic. I do everything on my schedule. What's that 20%? Jordan Peterson talks a lot about this. There's, there's a balance between chaos and order and everybody's going to have a natural default, right? My default is more order. And you have to work towards that, that balance of getting that sweet spot, right? Like I'm, I'm, my default is filling up my schedule, trying to cram everything in because I want to be so efficient and I, I have a good work ethic, right? But that's not a great thing. I need to have more chaos in my life and more spontaneity. Other people can be pure, pure, uh, spontaneous where they don't have a schedule, right? Yep. You might need more order. So you have to figure out where you're at. What's so interesting to me about the self-development world is I think you get into it. It doesn't matter if you're reading Peterson stuff, Covey stuff, Clayton Christensen, Peter Drucker, Tony Robbins. You get to this point where you start to recognize universal truth. Tremendous patterns. And there's yep. tons of patterns. Yep. And and then you can just recognize this is a true principle, what this guy's talking about. Let's 100%. go. Let's put it in the bucket yep. and let's let's go with it. And it just takes a tremendous amount of repetition to actually internalize it. Yeah. And that's like, what you said, teaching it, right? Yep. T teaching it accelerates that. You don't need to teach it, but it, it definitely accelerates retention. Yeah. Last thing I want to ask, then let's close it out, is right now in your life, like from the outside looking in, Somebody says, man, look at everything Casey's done, this incredible door-to-door -door career, now Sandlot Partners, and like, you kind of have it all. You're teaching at BYU. What's the most fulfilling thing in your life right now? I mean, it's not one thing. Like the, like I'm, what are your, what are your top I, things I, you that know, you just when, when, love? when somebody says, hey, I'm living my best life, I can, I can truly say I'm living my best life. Yeah. And, and one of the nicest compliments, I don't even know if he was giving it to me as a compliment, but I've taken it as a compliment was from Alex Dunn. He said, you're very deliberate. Hmm. And I'm like, I want to live a deliberate life. Yeah. You know, I want to say yes to the things that are important and say no to the things that aren't. And so, you know, when I think about my personal health, you know, like I'm cold plunging and cycling and doing yoga and golfing and that, like, I'm like so proud of all those things. Like I'm proud that I was a 25 handicap and I'm a 12 and I'm getting better. That's cool. So you see progress, you know, yeah. progress brings happiness, you know, in um, my business, I'm proud of the businesses that we built, you know, that we, we went out and we saw an opportunity and we took risk and we, you know, and proud of the investments that we've done. And I, I look at my family and I've got five kids and I'm really proud of the family that we built. And I'm, yeah. you know, I've got so many, friends that are getting divorces right now. And I'm proud that me and my wife have chose to stay married. We chose to invest in our relationship and, you know, anybody who's been married, it's not easy. Yeah. Like the, you know, the complacency kicks in in any relationship Yeah, and to commit, to keep it fresh and to invest in it and to continue to date forever. It is a real commitment that takes real energy on both ends. Um, and so, you know, th this last weekend, um, I took my entire family down to Lake Powell. So my mom, my dad, I'm one of seven kids. And, and we, you know, 
covered everything. That's we, cool. We, we covered the trip. We covered the you know, food, the whatever. flight. I, I took my plane up and picked my parents up in a plane. That and is like, so cool. I don't know. My mom had never flown in a plane. Wow. We land. Put my mom on a helicopter, fly her out to the, and she's <laughs> the just hospital. like, yeah. And then we like flew out a massage therapist oh and we're like, Hey goodness, mom, like, man. Hey, go get him. And like all these things were like things that she had never done. And I was so pumped about it, but it, I go back to this. I had this experience. I was 28 or 29 years old and Blackstone bought Vivint and I had some stock in the company and I made like six, 7 million bucks. And for me at that point, that was like my life's over, you know, like this, I've, I've made Game it, over. this is it, you know? <laughs> and I had this crossroads where it was about that same time that there's a guy named Todd Santiago. He gave me this book, um, called, um, how will you measure, how will you measure life by, by Clayton, Clayton. Christ, Clayton Christensen? Yeah. And he's a, he was a professor, professor at Harvard business school, you know, kind of beloved professor. He was kind of the original author of like disruptive innovation and this theory of disruption that kind of it's taught at every business I mean, master's it, program it's out kind there. of central He's to massive. you know and, yeah. and he kind of put a theory together and and was trained and all through kind of the technology boom of the late 90s and early 2000s but he teaches this course and a part of you know this course comes down to he talks about values and he says you value where you spend your time, where you spend your emotional energy, and where you spend your money. And it hit me so hard. I was 27, 28 years old, and I it hit me hard enough that I actually did a list, and I listed out everything that I said that I valued. And then next to it, I put time, energy, and, to see and money, and up. to see if I was actually congruent, if I sure. was actually like walking my walk. Yeah. And I saw major holes in my life. I saw some areas that I was doing great and I saw others that I had like major gaps. And one of those gaps was my relationship with my immediate family and my relationship with my parents. Mm -hmm. And I said that I valued that relationship, but I hadn't called them in a month. Wow. I hadn't yeah. invested any money. Yeah. You know, in that relationship. And I definitely hadn't given any time or emotional energy. And I'm like, I'm missing on all three. And I'm saying that this is important to me. And so I made a course correction. I just said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on the road a lot. And so, you know, me and my dad love baseball. And so I'm like, when I go to Chicago, I'm going to fly him out. We're going to go to Wrigley. When I, I'm in New York, I'm going to fly him out. We're going to go to Yankee Stadium. And when I'm in Boston, fly him out, we'll go to Fenway. And over the course of a decade, we've been to so wow. you know so many you know so many games and had these special the most special experiences I've ever had with my dad and my mom's come on some of the trips and even these family reunions. It was about the same time where I just said, like, I'm gonna allocate real money, I'm gonna allocate real time, and I'm gonna be present and I'm gonna do it annually. And I've done it since, and I've seen my relationship with my siblings and with my parents get significantly better where, you know, it's, it's a special relationship, but it came about from making a deliberate decision on, Hey, I actually do value this. Yeah. And two, I'm going to show that I value it by doing these things. And so when you say, Hey, what are you proud of? Um, I'm proud of the effort to live a deliberate congruent life and it's an effort it's you're off track every day every day you're screwing it up yeah but it's kind of a commitment to that continuous improvement a, con a commitment to be one percent better sure. in all aspects than you were the day before and to kind of be a master of your craft and to be professional and and you know as i look back yeah, that's what I'm the most proud of. And and honestly, like, that's what I look forward to. I'm turning 40 in a couple of weeks. And that's always kind of this mile mark in life where you're, you know, the, every birthday that ends with a zero, you kind of look at it and you say, am I doing, you know, what God put me on this earth to do? Yeah. And I look at kind of what I've done my first 40 years, and I'm really proud of, you know, what I've done. And I look forward to the future, and I just want to, do my best. I don't know what it's going to be, 
but I want to do my best. I want to like, when I think about like being on my deathbed, what gets me excited is the idea of just like leaving nothing on the field. Yeah. Like full, like serving as much as I can serve, working as hard as I can work, playing as hard as I can play. Yeah. Giving as much as I can give, you know, just act like squeezing all the juice out of life and, and, you know, along the way, you know, trying to change as many lives as I can change and try to be a light, try to be a good example, try to be, you know, a force for good and a force for God. And those are all, those are all things that drive me, that motivate and you, me. And you are Casey. I mean, I was thinking about it driving into the office today. I'm like, if you made a Mount Rushmore of door to door, you would be on there a hundred percent. No, that's you'd, super flattering. Thank you'd, you. You'd be on there. And it's, it's cool. Cause we, you have these conversations with the NBA and the greatest football players, all that stuff. Right. And, and I was like, why? And there's so many reasons why. And it's just because you've always been that light. You've always been that standard of pushing yourself to be better. And naturally that's just created such this big following, right? Yeah. That's followed you now into the new world of Sandlot and everything. I else. think it influences like influence influences so interesting because yeah. it's tough to like describe it. Yeah. But we all know who and what influences us, sure. which brands yeah. that we're just like, I'm drawn to this brand. Yeah. And it's excellence. Really, if you boil down to it, it's excellence. It's that they're world class. It's like that they have standards that are higher than everybody else, whether it's Porsche and design or whether it's Lululemon or whether it's, yeah, you know, Olympic athletes or like we're drawn to excellence because it's it's people and companies that commit to higher standards and it inspires us because yeah. all of us know that we have it in ourselves. There's days where we rise up and we're our best. And there's other days where, you know, we, we fall short, but to see that it's, it, 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 it does influence you because it, it, it inspires you to be better. Yeah. You know, and, and so a couple of takeaways from everything Casey just said to close this out is if you haven't read, how will you measure your life? Pick it up and go read. It. I think every person, including myself, that's ever read it has probably had that moment that Casey spoke about where you measure up everything where you're spending your time compared to where he says, and you'll have that moment where, shoot, I'm not really allocating time to where I need to be, right? So pick it up. Um, we start with Covey kind of telling it off with Covey. I got to know him right before he passed away. And one of the things he told me was live life in crescendo. And I, I'm like, what does that mean? And he said, live life with your best note ahead of you. And he was still doing it all the way till yeah. his last days. And I think you're going to, you're just going to freaking crush your next 40 years. So I'm excited to watch, but, um, just want to say thanks so much for coming on and thank you for how you've lived your life. We were driving home from St. George's last weekend is our kids fall break. And, and I've known this for a while. I've said this on the podcast, but the people that I love to keep close to me in my life are people that are intentional with their life. They're deliberate. You use the word deliberate. I use the word intentional. I don't care what faults they have, what they do or don't do anything about them. But if they're being intentional or deliberate in their life, to me, that's such an attraction. Like I just want them. It doesn't yep. matter if it's in the health world or financial world or spirituality. Yep. It's like, oh, makes sense. they're trying to live life by design instead of by default. And so my advice to anybody, if you're listening to this is if you know, people that are trying to live life by design, keep those people close to you because it'll impact your life so much. No, right? It's, it's the, the, there's that law that you just become the people that you associate with. You and and they, the, the closer the inner circle, the more you gravitate towards those people for good and for bad. You know, yeah. we're, we're, we're sitting around talking to my daughter last night and it's like, Hey, you know who your friends are matters. And she's kind of getting offended with this, that we're judgmental of her friends. And it's like, well, yeah, like you need to be careful who you let close to you because all, like we're going to be influenced one way or another. Yeah. And so be really selective, you know, be around people that are better than you, that, that inspire you to dream bigger and to do more and to work harder and to be kind and, you know, all the, all the stuff. And, you know, it, it's that rule that by not deciding you're deciding, you're going to get a life by default instead of by design. And yeah. that, I think that's the ultimate tragedy 
is you get to the end and you just have these regrets because you didn't create it. You just lived it. You just kind of got in the in the tide, you know? Yeah, I mean, being from Logan, my parents grew up in Logan. I was born in Logan. Like, you could be laying tile making 60K a year. Right well, and, Logan, and, and, right? and we, don't, we don't have any excuse living in America. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you live in America in 2022, you don't have any excuse. You know, I, the, the, every the, teaching, the, the, training, you whatever. Take the Ukrainian war right now. Yeah. And it just, it breaks my heart. Like totally. I, I, I watch it and I just think if I'm an entrepreneur in, in Kiev or, you know, one of the cities, Kirsten or one of these cities and you've worked your whole life and you've done everything right that you can do. And then like bombs start dropping and it all gets ruined in, in a heartbeat. And that's a lot of the world. Mm. And somehow we've lived in like this choice land with a democracy and you can beat it apart all you want, but they're like, it's the most trusted democracy in the world. As far as we have the, you know, world's financial system. That's our, you know, it's the U S dollar. Like people 100%. trust our laws. Um, and it's still the standard. And, and, and then you take 2022 and you're like, we're talking about personal development. You can at the, at your fingertips, you can access anything that you want in, in any corner of the world for good and for bad. Yeah. You know, and you, what, what it's that Tony Robbins quote that what's wrong is always available. But so is what's right. Mm. And it's, you're, you're going to get what you, you know, you're going to get what you search for. Yeah. And if you're looking for the bad, you're going to find the bad. And if you're looking for the good, you're going to find the good. And it's a choice. And, and a lot of people live life as if it's not a choice. And I think that's the, that's the life by default, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on Casey. I loved how intentional you are. And, and then even a layer, I'll just add one more layer on top of that is I think it's even more rare to find people that are very principle based. If you're trying to create the life you want to live and you're being guided by true eternal principles, then it's like, that's a unicorn. And that's what I feel like you are. Oh, thank you, brother. So thanks. Uh, man. I love being here with you.